Well, good morning. This is Barry O'Dell with the Church of Christ at Mammoth Spring Facebook page, and it is Tuesday morning, December 14th, 2021. Hope everybody's doing well today. And uh, got some folks joining on. Good morning, Brian. Good morning, Lyle, over on the Near Churches page. Good morning, Diana. Good to see folks joining on. There's Gail. <coughs> All right, so we are working our way through this study of the gods of Egypt. Somebody, hey Linda, someone had requested to study this idea found in Exodus 12, 12, where God said he would execute judgment upon all the gods of Egypt. So that's what we're looking at, and what does that all entail? And as you can see, I have a PowerPoint up here to kind of help you a bit uh, follow along with where I'm going in this study. So as I told you yesterday, uh, you know, you look at the polytheism of all these ancient civilizations, whether it's Egypt or Babylon or whatever, and man, they had gods for everything. And I think, you know, that kind of comes out, for instance, in Acts chapter 17 with the Athenians. Uh, when Paul was there, his spirit was stirred within him because he saw that the whole city was given to idolatry. And... Uh, we got some more. Good morning, Barry and Glenda. Good morning, Michelle. Connie's at the dentist. <laughs> well, good luck with all that. Good morning, Diana. All right, so Paul is in Athens, and his spirit is stirred within him because he sees that the city is wholly given to idolatry, and to such an extent that they have all of these... Um, images made and they to, to cover all of their gods and they even created one to the unknown god like just in case we missed anybody we don't want to leave anybody out and uh so here's here's an image to the unknown god and that's who then paul preached to them about so this is not uncommon to see polytheistic societies um creation myths the the myths of how the gods uh came to be how the gods reproduced even um, a lot of, it's interesting, you'd like to look at Egypt, and particularly like in the book of Revelation, um, you look at the Roman emperors, and in the process of time, they even consider themselves to be divine beings, or descent, at least descendants from divine beings. So there's a lot of history in this. And as I told you yesterday, I can't go through everything that the Egyptians believed because they, man, they had a God for everything. And one of the things that, well, just for instance, they had four different gods for the sun, okay, based on what the, where the sun was. Was it rising? Was it, you know, like high noon? Was it setting? What was it doing as it was in the underworld? They believed that the sun, when it set, then it went into the underworld. Well, what was it doing down there? So we're looking at what the plagues what the plagues were, okay, throughout the book of Exodus, and we'll be starting in chapter 7 today, and what, in what manner each of those plagues executed judgment on, say, specific gods of the Egyptians. So let me pull up my PowerPoint here real quick, so I can see it, I know you guys can see it, and then uh, we'll get started. All right, so I laid some historical groundwork for you yesterday in considering how did they, how are we in Egypt, all right? How did this even come to be? So we talked about the history of uh, Joseph being sold into captivity, ultimately ending up in, in Egypt. Uh, Jacob and his boys needing to go to Egypt for grain because of famine and how all of that worked out. Uh, we looked briefly at Moses and Aaron, the two brothers, children of Amram and Jochebed, and they are 80, Moses was 80, and Aaron was 83 when they started to appear before Pharaoh to tell him to let God's people go. And God would, according to Exodus 7 and verse 4, multiply signs against Pharaoh. And one of the interesting things that I pointed out is the signs that we see there were for the same purpose that we read about the signs in the New Covenant. Uh, and so I talked about that a bit yesterday with John 20, 30, and 31, that these things were performed, these signs were performed to produce faith. And 
we, we kind of see that evolution throughout the ten plagues. Some of the Egyptians began to believe that um, this God of Moses and Aaron is quite different than, than the gods of Egypt. So anyway, yesterday we started out talking about, this is, now this is not one of the ten plagues, but this was a sign to Pharaoh and the magicians, okay, the sorcerers and such. Uh, his rod changing into a serpent. And, well, one of the Egyptians go- Egyptian gods was a um, cobra-headed deity. He was the god of chaos. He was the enemy of the sun god Ra. And it's, that's kind of another interesting thing about polytheism is that the gods are often punitive and angry gods. You know, it's like they're just waiting for you to mess up. And the gods war amongst themselves. So, again, there's a lot of mythology. And we're not going into all of that. But the sign that was given to Moses there, his rod into a serpent, well, the magicians, you remember, they were able to do that too. But then uh, Moses and Aaron's serpent swallowed up theirs, which indicated superiority of the gods to, certainly to an Egyptian. So let's then today get into the ten plagues. I don't know how far we'll get. We'll just see how it goes. So the first of the ten plagues was this changing or the turning of the water into blood. We're not going to read all of the text, but it's found in Exodus 7, verses 14 to 25. Um, Verse 14 says, Pharaoh's heart is hard. He refuses to let the people go. So that's another issue that comes out throughout this study is the hardening of Pharaoh's hearts, uh, the hardening of his heart, because sometimes the text will say that Pharaoh hardened his heart, And then other times the text will say that God hardened his heart. Well, I think the key to understanding what both of those phrases mean is right here in Exodus 7, 14. He refused to let the people go. He hardened his heart, but God also, in a sense, hardened his heart because what God was requiring of Pharaoh, Pharaoh didn't want to do. And so God's requirements, in that sense, hardened Pharaoh's heart. So... Okay, the water to blood. Well, of course, you look at a map of Egypt, and, I mean, right down the middle, you have the Nile River that flows uh, into the sea, and at the northern end uh, of that, you have what's called the Nile Delta, the Nile River Delta. Well, they had a god by the name, and I, you know, I don't know how to pronounce all these. I'm not Egyptian. I'm going with Hopi here, okay? The Egyptian god Hopi. He was the deity of fertility and the floods of the Nile. And so, you know, you dig a little bit into history and agriculture over there, and the Nile River was known for flooding annually, like from July to September. And those floods produced more fertile soil. And so even like if you look a sa- look at a satellite image of Nile, of, of the Nile and of Egypt, everything right around the river and then the Nile Delta is green and, and lush, let's say. Everything else is, once you get outside of that, okay, turns pretty uh, dry and sandy and and, uh, desert-like. So he's the deity of fertility and the floods of the Nile. Well, this first of the ten plagues struck the river, of course. Um, Exodus 7, beginning in verse 19, The Lord spoke to Moses, say to Aaron, Take your rod and stretch out your hand over the waters of Egypt, over their streams, over their rivers, and over their... And notice the extent of this. It's not just the Nile. Uh, The streams, rivers, okay, like the tributaries, all of this. The ponds, the pools of water, okay, even the wells, uh, that that they may become blood. And there shall be blood throughout all the land of Egypt, both in buckets of wood and pitchers of stone. Okay, so they've got water set aside. It's all going to be turned into blood. So they do that. And so not only is that God of Egypt, okay, Hopi, this deity of fertility and the floods of the Nile, not only is that a strike against him, but then it's even against their uh, a major source of food. The fish that were in the river died, verse 21. The river stank, and the Egyptians could not drink the water of the river, So there was blood throughout all the land of Egypt. All right. Now, one of the interesting things is, so this happens. Well, then Pharaoh calls in his, as it says here in Exodus 7, 22, magicians, and they do so with their enchantments. And that word enchantments in the uh, Hebrew means uh, like secrecy or uh, mysterious workings. And 
they were able to turn blood, uh, rather, now, water into blood, okay? They were able to change the appearance of the water. I'll say it that way. Um, these are not authentic miracles that these guys are performing. Now, the miracles that come from Jehovah, obviously, are authentic. And and again, as, as this process of these plagues unravels, um, even some of the Egyptians start noticing the differences between the God of Moses and the gods of Egypt. Well, so because the magicians of Egypt could change the appearance of some water, well, Pharaoh's heart is hardened. But notice again the superiority of the act of God here, um, as opposed to the act of these magicians. Exodus 7, 24, So all the Egyptians dug all around the river for water to drink, because they could not drink the water of the river, and seven days passed after the Lord uh, had struck the river. So that that indicates a superiority to uh, in the action of God as com opposed to the action of the magicians of Pharaoh. All right? So there's a strike, there's a judgment executed upon the gods of one of the gods of Egypt. The next plague is recorded for us in Exodus 8, verses 1 through 15, and this is the plague of frogs. Now, a couple of interesting things to note here is where these frogs come from. All right, so you look at Exodus 8 and verse 5. Stretch out your hand with your rod over the streams, the rivers, and the ponds, and cause frogs to come up out of the land of Egypt. So again, the water is the source of where this plague is going to come from, which, again, is a strike against... I mean, the Nile River, man, that's like that's the source of life in Egypt. And so some of these plagues come out from that, um, from that source of sustenance, let's say. Well, the Egyptian goddess, her name Heket, or Hect, was the goddess of fertility, and she is portrayed in various images as either a human body with a frog's head or a frog in general. Well, the goddess of fertility. Okay, well, it becomes a plague. This thing that they worship, this animal that they worship, now becomes a plague uh, at the hands of Moses and Aaron. And you notice it says in 8.6, Aaron stretched out his hand over the waters of Egypt, and the frogs came up and covered the land of Egypt. Okay, now the magicians do so with their enchantments and brought up frogs on the land of Egypt. And the question is, well, how, do, how are they able to do that? Okay, what, <clears throat> what power do they have to produce these things? And so I'll address that. I'm not going to address that right now because we see this happen a couple of times in these plagues. But how are these magicians able to, in some way, mimic what is being done by God himself? Well, remember, the, the word for enchantment has to do with a mysterious working or a uh, uh, like a secret that they had. They could do something that appeared to be what God was doing, but there's a difference in all of these. So uh, as we go further through this, I'll talk more about that. Well, of course, Pharaoh calls, er, calls for Moses and Aaron, asks for this to come to an end. Uh, verse 8, and it does come to an end. Tomorrow, verse 10, let it be according to your word that you may know that there is no one like the Lord our God. So these frogs came up from everywhere, every source of water, and tomorrow it's going to go away just as quickly as it showed up. And again, that shows the superiority of the God of Moses. Well, it happened that way, verse 13, and if you look at Exodus eight thirteen, the frogs died out of the houses out of the courtyards, and out of the fields. They gathered them together in heaps, and the land stank. So, um, as it came in, so it went out. And what Moses said would happen, and Aaron said would happen, did happen. It's a strike against one of the gods, or one of the goddesses, rather, of fertility. And one of the things you'll notice, too, with these various Egyptian uh, gods and goddesses is... Uh, is that th there's some overlap in what they are gods or goddesses over. And so, um, yeah, you just notice that as we go through here. I was just looking at some comments. Apparently some are having trouble with the stream. So far as I can tell, everything's working fine. But anyway, 
That's your second of the ten plagues, the plague of frogs. And then number three, and this one's kind of interesting. So as these, again, as these are being enumerated for us in the text, there are little differences that you will see as you're reading the account. Some accounts of these plagues are longer than other plagues, like the, the next one, number three, the plague of lice is rather short. Uh, so Exodus 8, beginning in verse 16, uh, say to, now, now this is one that was unannounced. So sometimes they would go before Pharaoh and say, here's what's going to happen, here's when and how it's going to happen. Well, this one here, the Lord just speaks to Moses, and Moses is to speak to Aaron. Stretch out your rod and strike the dust of the land so that it may become lice, uh, verse 16. Now, we typically think of that as lice. Uh, it, it's interesting, a marginal reading here for the word lice is gnats, okay, some type of insect. And we do know that the Egyptians worshipped insects, uh, specifically one uh, that that still is showing up and was rather prominent was the uh, the beetle. So anyway, lice, gnats, whatever the case may be, some type of insect here. Throughout all the land of Egypt, they did so. Aaron stretched out his hand with his rod and struck the dust of the earth. So they struck the water a couple of times. This one now is from the, the, the plague is coming from the ground. Well, the Egyptians worshipped a god by the name of Geb. And he was the god of the literally the dust, the god of the ground. And uh, the pharaohs actually believed that they were descendants. Well, this is one of the gods from which they descended. There are multiple gods that they even have a hierarchy, you know, which God was first and which one was more powerful and all this. But this is one of the gods that they believe that the Pharaohs descended from. So this source of the very kings of Egypt, the ground, the god of the ground, Geb, is now the source of this plague. Um, notice the difference here too now. Exodus eight eighteen. Now the magicians so worked their enchantments to bring forth lice, gnats, whatever, but they could not. Okay, so changing the appearance of water from one thing to another, okay, that, that could be done. The appearance of frogs, you know, how do you call in a bunch of frogs? I don't know. I've done a lot of frog gigging, gigging over the years and eating frog legs, but I've never been able to summon frogs. But They couldn't repeat this enchantment here, or this, I'm sorry, their enchantments couldn't repeat this miracle that was performed. And so notice the reaction of the sorcerers of Pharaoh, Exodus 8, 19. This is the finger of God, okay? This is the action, uh, an act of God himself. Well, Pharaoh's heart grew hard, and he did not heed them, just as the Lord had said. So here's another strike against another god of the Egyptians, the god of the ground. Okay, so I think we'll look at one more today. And then we'll cut it off. This is plague number four, the plague of flies. All right. Again, another insect. Um, I'm, again, I'm not going to read all of this to you. It's Exodus 8, verses 20 through 32. But notice there's a, there's a significant part here. Verse 23. Okay, so think about flies for just a minute. So it's it's mid-December here in, here in uh, northern Arkansas. And we've had some weird weather lately. We've still got flies. Man, those things are... Well, let's just say they're annoying, all right? Nobody likes flies buzzing around their head or their food or whatever the case may be. And, you know, how do you keep flies in? You can't fence them in. Uh, <laughs> they reproduce seemingly rather rapidly. Look at 823. I will make a difference between my people and your people. Tomorrow this sign shall be. Uh, and the Lord did so. Thick swarms of flies came into the house of Pharaoh and unto his servants' houses. And in all the land of Egypt, the land was corrupted because of the swarm of flies. Well, if you look back up at verse 22, the land in which my people dwell, no swarms of flies shall be there. There's a distinction made between what's going on in Egypt and Goshen. So Goshen, if you're looking at a biblical map, it's kind of between... Uh, the promised land in Egypt is here. So Goshen is the, in this region here. Uh, it's a real detailed map for you, I know. But uh, between the promised land and Egypt, no flies. 
Well, there's something to that, all right? So anyway, it seems also to indicate that the ground itself was polluted with flies, and again, that would be another strike against the gods of the dust, the gods of the earth, specifically Geb, that the Egyptians worshipped. And But not only that, the, the difference... Again, you know, how do you, how do you keep flies in one part of the land? Well, you don't, but God did. And it showed a distinction between the God of Moses and Aaron and the uh, gods of the Egyptians. And so then, of course, he removes the swarm of flies. You go down to verse 31 from his servants and from his people. Not one remained. Boy, that would be nice sometimes if you could get rid of the flies and not one remained. But Pharaoh hardened his heart. All right, so you've got strikes against the gods of the waters. You've got now strikes or judgments against the gods of the ground. And I think we'll cut it off there today. We've already been going for 20 minutes, but we'll pick it up back here tomorrow, Lord willing, at 11 o'clock. I don't see any questions or comments. Just all the greetings. And like I said, some folks were having some issues with the video feed, but I think everything's been okay. All right, guys, I'm going to cut it off. Oh, Connie's still waiting to be called back. Yeah, that's the way it goes in the, well, in any kind of office, typically. Glad you were with us today. All right, guys, after the stream's over, you can still comment or question. Um, we'll pick up tomorrow on the fifth plague in Exodus. We'll start, actually, in Exodus chapter 9. The Plague Against Livestock. So thanks for being here today, guys. Uh, as always, if you have anybody that'd like to do these studies who does not do Facebook, send them over to our YouTube channel. All of that content is available there. And you can comment on, in, in YouTube. Like if you have a Gmail account, you will also have a YouTube account. You can sign in and you can comment. You can interact with each individual episode on our YouTube channel. All right, guys. Hope you all have a good day and hope to see you back here tomorrow at 11 o'clock.